Hi, this is Kelsey Fukowski for AP Gov Review. And in Unit 3 in this particular video, we're going to be looking at political parties and their organization. This will cover Part 1 and Part 2. So political parties, right? Just your basic definition, a group that seeks to elect a candidate to public office by giving candidates an identification that is recognizable to the electorate or constituency. So typically, if you're going to see somebody who's running for office, whether it's the mayor, whether it's a town council, or as high up as the president of the United States, you typically are going to look for one of two letters, either a D for Democrat or R for Republican, and immediately voters can see whether or not you may uh, agree or disagree with that person just based on that particular letter. Now, it's important to know that party identification used to be very, very strong, and over the past few decades, it has grown tremendously weaker. And if you are aware of politics between 2010 and to the present, at least in 2016, you will notice that really party identification is weak. Now, when we look at political parties, you can look at them in three major organizational parts. Party and electorate, that means people who belong to the party, party as an organization, and party in government. When we're looking at organization, we are looking at it with this great sound, uh, you're looking at the structure that organizes and coordinates the party at the national, state, and local levels. And then party and government is just going to refer to those within the government who have been elected. Now, party and electorate, that is, of course, the largest component of the party. You don't need dues or a membership card, unlike many European countries. Party and organization, again, there are many bylaws, there are many procedures, you do have national, state, local offices, but again, the whole idea is keeping the party together, keeping them intact, helping candidates who are running uh, even during elections or also between elections. And then you have, of course, your party and government, those are your elected officials of the party, but it's important to note that even though they might belong to that political party, they may not always agree on that specific policy. So that's important to keep in mind. Of course, that makes sense as you only have two political parties. You can't necessarily represent everybody's specific belief with over 300 million Americans living in the country today. So when we look at the tasks of parties, one word that you're going to see come up on the AP Gov exam, linkage institutions. This is a critical, critical unit to understand this word or this particular term. A linkage institution is the channels through which people's concerns become political issues on the government's policy agenda. So political parties are a conduit in which people's concerns, what they want to see government accomplish, are going through the political parties that helps set their agenda as to what the candidates are going to be running for. And then in turn, when those candidates get elected, should they get elected, they're going to shape policy, pass bills, you know, get them passed. And then, of course, that bill would become a law. So the linkage institution is connecting people to the agenda. That's very, very important to note. And political parties are, of course, a linkage institution. Now, parties do serve many roles and tasks. It is very common that you will see some type of FRQ that will ask you about the role or task of a political party. So when we look at political parties, they're helpful in the way that they nominate. They provide an official endorsement, typically during the national convention. Prior to the 20th century, actually those within the political party themselves would actually choose the candidates. So political parties have become more democratic over time, especially in the 20th century. Parties are going to be running campaigns, as we said earlier. They may uh, endorse you know, particular candidates and run um, television ads, radio ads, you name it, and they will coordinate this at the local state and especially the national campaigns. They also help voters by coordinating their party image in terms of what they stand for. They're also watchdogs, very important, similar to the media, that they're going to be very quick to point out wrongdoing of the other party or something that's controversial. Are they looking necessarily to be the good guys? That might be part of it, but really the bigger reason for being a watchdog is, hey, I want to take that person's voters and you know convert them to our political party so they will certainly you'll see it all the time whether it's on cnn or fox news where you'll have a particular politician decrying matters from another party and they also are going to coordinate policy making in terms of laws uh in terms of the coordinating policy amongst the three branches and state government so if something's you know they want to work something at the national level and also bring it to the state level 
so be it. So again, when we look at it in linkage institutions, really it's important to know this chart. So you have people which, of course, have interest, you know, whether it's college funding, whether it's getting a stop sign, you know, built on your local road. Well, that those issues are going to be conveyed through linkage institutions, parties, elections, media, interest groups, all chapters that we're going to be looking at. And as a result, you're going to see that when they, if that politician gets elected through the political uh, parties, you will have those people putting those issues in making them maybe into laws and of course that's going to go through your three main branches of government and if it's successful enough it will become policy which is impacting the people in the end so it, it does take a lot for uh, one to change policy and again it starts at the very basic elements of the people in the electorate but then it goes through its appropriate channels but what connects people to the agenda the linkage institutions so definitely know that so why a two-party system? Really, there is a history of a two-party system. If you're familiar with a AP uh, U.S. history, if you've already taken the course or you're taking U.S. history, uh, certainly there is a history of that uh, entrenched in the United States, starting with the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. So just history on that. Also, you have your Federalists and Anti-Federalists, which would emerge into the two parties aforementioned. And even though Washington you know, warns of political parties, and the destruction that he foresees them creating. You see that in Madison's Federalist Papers, uh, number 10, is warning against factions, but saying that, you know what, they're inevitable, that in some ways they are helpful in that they're checking one another. So again, as a result of that, you have this two-party system, but it's actually very characteristic of mainly the United States. Few countries only have two political parties. In Europe, it's very, very common where you have uh, a proportional representation in which the votes or the percentage that parties get is divided. So it's not a winner take all. So this is important to know this term, pluralist meaning winner takes all. So even if a Democrat gets, you know, 51% uh, of the nationwide election, that Democrat wins, right? So it, the votes are not dispersed evenly by any means. However, in Europe, in many countries, uh, for example, England, you know, if you got if one party got a third of the vote, then they would get a third of the representation. So keep that in mind. So when we look at the meaning of party, uh, one thing that's interesting to look at is the rational choice theory, which assumes that individuals are going to act in their own best interests, weighing the costs and benefits of possible alternatives. So they're going to basically vote for the person who suits him or herself the most. And the Downs model, which goes along with this, is basically saying that voters maximize chances that policies they favor are adopted by government. So again, parties want to you know, win elected office. How do they do that? Well, through the, the Downs model. If you look at most people here in the United States, this is a nice little curve here where you look at the number of people who consider themselves extremely liberal versus extremely conservative. Well, if you're a politician who wants to win office, are you going to be appealing to the extremes or will you be appealing to the people who most of the time consider themselves moderate? So some are slightly liberal, but that doesn't mean they can't vote for a Republican or vice versa. So this is the general area within the Downs model in which many politicians you know, try to go after because they feel that they have the best chance. And even when you look at you know the differences between Democrats and Republicans, really the independents are very, very important because you can't win an election with just your party alone. You definitely have to appeal to those moderates. So it's important to believe to note that uh, most Americans are moderates, and two thirds of po the population believe important differences between the parties. Mainly, it could be domestic spending, it could be on taxes, whereas Democrats. Uh, do you want more government intervention or programs? So with that said, let's continue on to part two and looking at the political party model. Of course, you have the political organization, you have the party in the electorate and the party in the government, as we were talking about before, all serving important needs to keep the political party afloat. In particular, the party in the electorate, when we look at the, uh, the party image, the voter perception of what Republicans or Democrats stand for, that's very, very important. Because if you're somebody who really believes in a really strong defense, uh, a big military, you're going to say, you know, Republicans look at that. Or if you're the opposite, you're going to say, no, I want for Democrats. 
So certainly party identification is important in the sense that you want citizens to identify with the party, you want them to prefer your party. And with two political parties in the United States today, Republicans and Democrats, there's not much room for minority parties or third parties. So as a result, you have parties, they can't really stray too far from the middle, otherwise they're going to be losing the, uh, a good number of voters. So there is though an increasing percentage who are declining to identify with either party. People have become disillusioned with American politics over the past couple decades. And you see that especially with younger voters. Uh, in particular, with the Bernie Sanders campaign, there, you know, who he's attracted many younger voters, after he lost the nomination, uh, you have also a lot of younger voters who are refusing to you know, become supporters of Hillary Clinton for a wide variety of reasons. So again, that's showing you that people are not necessarily attached to the party as much as they are attached to the candidate. So keep that in mind. So the party in the electorate, when you go voting, uh, and typically you vote for, you know, during a presidential election, you could be voting for up to 10, 15 people to, uh, in terms of offices. So we've seen what is known as ticket splitting, where you vote one party for one office and then you vote for a person of another party for another office. So you're not really going right down checking off Democrat or Republican uh, the entire ticket. You're really alternating. And where we see this, of course, are independents who don't really have a strong uh, affiliation to any po political party. So it's important to note that no state or race is completely safe due to uh, split tickets. So again, if you look at this person's lawn sign, this guy's supporting a Democrat for some office, whether and then at the same time su supporting a Republican for Senate. So this is a good example of ticket splitting. So as a result of this, this has caused divided government where you have just a mixture of Republicans and, and Democrats, um, whether it's in the Senate, you might have more Democrats, whereas in the House of Representatives, you might have more Republicans. So you don't have, you know, a unanimous uh, government that's either Democratic or Republican. It tends to be all mixed. In the 1950s, about 12% engaged in ticket splitting. Today, you're looking as high as 40%. So this is bringing a higher amount of what, of course, we've known as policy gridlock, where it's become very difficult for that to, um, for things to get done in Washington, a major criticism. So when we look at party identification, Democrats are declining with a slight uptick by 2004. Also with Republicans as well, sort of has remained steady a little bit under 30%. Yet, if you look at independence, that has grown in almost close to the 40% mark. So certainly a major phenomenon going on. So there are, of course, people who work for the party at the local level. You used to have what are known as uh, party machines. And that's when you saw more corruption and you'd be promised a job, for example, or be provided with some service uh, as a result of your loyalty to that political party. So, of course, that is illegal um, as a result of the Hatch Act, which will prevent federal officials from actively participating in politics. And then on top of that, um, you saw these general, these urban party machines, if you're familiar with Boss Tweed, uh, being cut out. Since then, you've seen sort of a revitalization of uh, the party organization at the county level, especially in rural areas, as more yard signs literature is coming about. Um, but again, really at the local level, not as heavy, heavily focused as you ne necessarily see at the state or national level. So almost done here. So when we look at the process of selecting a party candidate for office, you have what are called closed primaries, which only registered Republicans or only registered Democrats are allowed to vote. So that, of course, encourages greater party loyalty, because if you don't belong to the party, you can't vote. You also have open primaries, whether and that allows voters to decide uh, whether they want to vote in the Democratic or Republican primary uh, that day, and they can only choose one. And then you have what are called blanket primaries, which voters are presented with a list of candidates from all parties. You do not see many states with blanket, part, uh, blanket primaries. You undoubtedly do need to know these three different types of primaries without a doubt, and definitely knowing that closed primaries encourage greater party loyalty will help you immensely. And then we've seen states become better organized you know, over the past uh, 10 years or so, or as much as 20 years, um, as budgets dedicated towards campaigning have risen eight times as much. So that shows you just right there. So I'm going to give you a review question real quickly. Take a moment to uh, study the question. 
All right, and this hopefully shouldn't have been too difficult since it was the last slide. So if you click uh, close primary, you are correct.